Okay. Oh, I'm in um, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, for the hmm. Dollywood. Dollywood's doing a media like opening tomorrow, so. Oh, cool. Yes, as we're talk talking about <laughs> slowing down. <laughs> Let's do as much as we can. Oh, here we go. Right, right, totally. <laughs> That's funny. Hmm. Hi everyone, welcome to our Faith Gateway Live Author Chats. I'm your host, Sammy Cohn, your curator of the Faith Gateway Family section, and I'm joined tonight by Tish Oxenreiter. Hi Tish, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to talk about this book. Tish is the author of Notes from a Blue Bike. Does it have to be a blue bike, Tish? We just want to know. Does it have no, to be? No, it doesn't. I know, but they're everywhere. You know, when you buy a new car and you start seeing it everywhere, I see blue yeah. bikes everywhere now. So. Yeah, it's it's the thing. We love it. Well, no yeah. from the blue bike. We're going to dig into that. We've got the questions coming in on Twitter. If you want to join the conversation, make sure you tweet us. Hashtag notes from a blue bike. We'll incorporate as many of those as possible in our time together tonight. But Tish, why don't you start us off and just let our audience know a little bit more about who you are and what's what's brought you along to this bike loving journey. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, well, my husband and three kids and I live in Bend, Oregon, which is a town of about 80,000 people, but we haven't always lived here. We lived here just a couple of years. I grew up in Austin, Texas, which is a really big city, and um, my husband and I met overseas in a small war-torn village in Kosovo, and so we had always together before we even married wanted to live overseas and so when we got married that was kind of the natural next step for us and um, long story short we ended up living in Turkey for the first um, chunk of our marriage with our one oldest daughter who was two at the time and then we um, had our second there and so we have this experience in our family of living overseas and what had happened was we had always wanted to live overseas but I still wasn't ready for it. I thought of myself as um, not your typical American who is obsessed with productivity or um, getting a lot done or, or just making a lot of money just to have fun on the weekend and yet I was surprised how much of that I carried over to my life in Turkey. I had to relearn how to do everything and so I just learned a lot in those three years we lived in Turkey about what it looks like to slow down in almost every asset, uh, aspect of life and um, that slowing down helps live more with more intention and um, where we can make better choices just that reflect our daily um, priorities and so when we came back we ended up moving to a small town and my book the uh, notes from a blue bike basically chronicles the question we asked ourselves when we moved to Bend which is can you live the way you can overseas which tends to be relationship based cultures mm -hmm. but here in a culture that uh, worships productivity and um, being efficient is it even possible to live slowly here yeah and so I joke it's not a although it has a travelogue aspect to it it is not a cycling journal by any means it is You're right really, it is really representative why why the title why I know you've alluded to it a little bit in that background you just gave us but what what does that blue bike signify to you as, as a, that tie-in for the book mm -hmm. Well, I do have a blue bike sitting in my garage, and it was a birthday present for my husband Kyle the first summer we here we were here. We moved in the summer, and a few weeks later, he gave me this bike, Great. and so it was very symbolic to me. We didn't think of it at the time; we just thought of it as a fun gift. But it ended up being very symbolic of this idea of slowing down here in the US um, that this bike was going to take me places but much slower it was going to force me to stop and small doses more to um, live a little smaller radius you know from where our home was and um, just take in more of what was around me and you know we're a one car family and so this became our second vehicle of sorts so the book begins and ends with the bike mm -hmm. and I tell a little bit of the backstory at the beginning and then it ends with um, just some thoughts about um, you know the bike riding journey. Yeah, one of my favorite parts about the book was when you you kind of took that step, I think it was one of the moments when you had that aha moment of <laughs> how can we, just because we're not living abroad anymore doesn't mean we can't live that way here and you you chronicled all the things that you know what did that look like? You actually took the time to write that down. What were some of those things that you really wanted to capture that you felt was missing from your life once you moved back to the states that you tried to you know literally pinpoint? Well, um, you know the book is divided into five sections because those are the five things that um, 
that seemed most prevalent to us here in the states that were difficult to slow down in and were also the most um, all-consuming parts of our life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, we go through food, work, travel, entertainment, and education. But I think one of the overall um, feelings we got that sort of covered all areas was just this feeling of crazy busyness and that we have this idea that being busy is a good thing. That mm -hmm. being busy equals you are doing something with your time and your life. Mm -hmm. And that if you're not busy, that's, you know, it's almost like a, um, just a negative quality about yourself if you're mm -hmm. not staying busy. And so we just have this weird obsession with busyness, I feel like. And that, co that just affects everything. That affects relationships, you know. In Turkey, we were able to call up a friend or be called by a friend to see if we wanted to have lunch that day or lunch that night and it was an you know a, a day's less than a day's advance notice and we would show up and we would honestly spend all day mm -hmm. um, we we have these fond memories of spending time with our Turkish neighbors where they would call us over for dinner and we would stay there till midnight for like six hours and that was just sort of the MO there it wasn't unusual they weren't trying to make a point it was just relationships coming first you know before a to-do mm -hmm. list before being proficient or efficient and um, here you know we were just shocked you know even though we grew up here we were still reminded that you know, to hang out with people you have to make a three-week um, advance you know commitment on the calendar sometimes even longer than that and you know you have dinner maybe two hours three hours and so it not that that's a you know that that's wrong it just says right. something about our culture I think so absolutely but it wasn't necessarily easy just because you pinpointed that it wasn't easy to make that switch what were some of the speed bumps that you came across you know you, you realize like you said and, and in a way it was easy because you you literally lived out those two you know contrasting cultures you came back you realized this isn't you know what I thought it was but then what were some of those speed bumps that you tackled as you tried mm -hmm. to you know embrace the best of of that life that you'd experienced here in the States? Well, you know, it's funny. Like, we, my family can have this idea of what we want to do, but that doesn't mean the rest of the culture is just going to suddenly mm -hmm. slow down. You know, we can't just suddenly invite ourselves over or have someone over and expect them to stay for six hours or, you know, invite them that day, just to use the example from before. And so, honestly, the speed bump was American culture, that, you know, that we want to do things one way, but, you know, it would honestly be swimming upstream because the just the default here is not slow and so the the biggest struggle was the culture I mean it was also ourselves you know we we were surprised at how much we did just jump right back into some of these fast-paced ways of living of you know driving everywhere of um, filling up every possible slot in our calendar of eating not so much convenience food because we had always eaten you know whole food but not actually savored it or slowed down or made an event mm. out of the meals we made. Um, you know, working online was a challenge because you're never done, you know. You, mm -hmm. you don't ever just finish the day and say, I got absolutely everything I wanted to do and, you know, it's 5 p.m. and I've got the day off. It, it was, it took a lot of conscious effort to to close down the shop, that, stuff like that. It was a lot of just internal and cultural um, pressures to not slow down. Absolutely. And obviously your faith played a large part in this realization too. It wasn't just living abroad, but tell, can you tell our audience a little bit about how, I mean, you just saw that intertwining of your faith and this message that you were trying to live out? Yeah, well, you know, um, there's really no reason to live simply or slowly just for the end, you know, for, as an end unto itself. You'll burn out, you'll get bitter, you'll get frustrated. Um, the The core reason that we felt it was so important to slow down was because we felt like our priority needed to be people and not accomplishments or getting things done and the reason we felt like people should be our priority is because that was Jesus's priority you know yeah. and he's it seems to be fairly clear in his word that um, that relationships matter for eternity you know they're people are the only one of the only things that are, are going to live for eternity and so if that's his priority that should be our priority and we felt like we were going so fast we didn't have time for people around us you know mm -hmm. and there was something in in its very core that was wrong with that we felt um, and it was also because we felt like we couldn't be our true selves and we, we couldn't be our true selves because we were either too busy or because we were just assuming what the culture says is the most important thing should also be the most important thing for us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, 
our experience of sitting down and actually writing down what are our family's essential values mm -hmm. and um, how can we write this into sort of a family mission statement of sorts um, was essential because then we were able to more freely say no and yes to the things you know that were vying for our attention because so often it's not bad versus good right. it's good versus great right these choices we make and um, the only way we would know know who we were about our core selves was to you know bring it up to God talk to him about it you know really research how he made us and, and pray through it together and and ask good questions and it's a continual journey still yeah now you made a good point earlier that I want you to expand upon a little bit about how <laughs> we don't want to just be slow for slow sake obviously you're not mm -hmm. saying don't be productive sit around with you know a lemonade in your hand on the hammock all day and just wait for life to happen to you you know I don't want people to get confused so how have yeah. you managed especially you have three children you know, how have you managed to share that value of, uh, you know, productivity? You know, just define how you now look at productivity versus busyness. And like I said, I think in, you said in America that can be synonymous and they're not necessarily the same thing. Can you help our moms sure. out there especially really delineate how can I feel like I've been productive without feeling like I'm harried all day? Yes. Yes, for sure. You know, we really do worship busyness. And to me, I've learned the difference between a busy plate and a full plate. You know, a busy plate is the one where there's stuff falling off. A full mm -hmm. plate means you, um, you're you at capacity, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing to live very full lives. And that there are seasons, you know, even hours and every day, that might feel busier than you would prefer. It's not so much a, you know, this call to action of making everybody do what you want to do because you prefer to live slowly. Um, it's, it's more of this idea that we live simply so that others can li uh, simply live and we live slowly so that um, we can experience what it really actually means to live simply. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, living slowly does not necessarily mean only riding your bike everywhere or only driving slowly or only you know, going out of the house once a week. I mean, it look, the reason that the book doesn't have a lot of specific takeaways is because it looks different for every family. Right. It's much more the question of asking yourself, what are your, who, what is true about you, that the way God made you, and what are the essentials? Yeah. Well, you led me so well into my <laughs> next question, of course. Okay. Now, we're not looking for, like I said, that to-do list or that task list of here's what I can do, because like you said, I think it is important to really give it up to God, you know, spend that time questioning your family, What what is our value, but if you could offer one piece of advice, one tip that people would take away from tonight uh, to help move them towards this path to intentionality, what, what would you suggest? Um, people ask me a lot, like what's the one thing they should start with when it comes to simplifying their life or mm -hmm. living a little more intentionally, and the answer I always give is to take a lot of time to write a family mission statement. You know, it's kind of what I just said earlier, but um, it really is that important. You know, I think sometimes people are looking for the answer of like, get rid of 10 boxes of things or, um, <laughs> you know, but the problem I is, is if I, yeah, well the thing is if I give a very specific um, takeaway, that's just not going to be the case for everybody. Someone's yeah. problem might not be having too much stuff or it might not be mm -hmm. um, too busy of a calendar, but it, it honestly, I think the reason so much of us at our core are wanting to live with more intention is because maybe deep down we feel like we're not being who we really are. And so to take time, to take several days a week maybe even, to ask yourself good questions about um, just what are you made, what is important to you. Um, and then talk, if you're married, talk about it with your spouse and ask, you know, the same questions of him and what's true about you and your family culture. You know, like yeah. for an example, one of ours was um, to be lifelong learners, to yeah. um, to take, to be good stewards of the earth or of creation, those kinds of things. That's not necessarily universal for everybody, but that was, those are the, the core values for us that we felt like would be true no matter what stage, no matter what age our kids were in, that those were important to us. And so once we wrote down our mission statement, you know, that we kind of could stand back and realize, oh, these are our priorities and this is what makes us us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. For those of you just, join, just joining us, we are talking with Tish Oxenreiter, author of Notes from a Blue Bike. We want to let everyone know, too, that for 48 hours only, you can get an extra 25% off the already discounted price as long as you use Bike25 at store.faithgateway.com. We also have a link below our live chat right here. So make sure you pick up Tish's book if you haven't already. Tish, you were a blogger before you were 
an author. Some of us that are bloggers would like to think that's synonymous as well. Yes, right. <laughs> right. And, and you mentioned earlier too, it, it's not as easy as, not that a bank job or a library job isn't easy, but or is, but you go and you, you can leave your work at work and you come home. Doing what you do, th there is no end time. And for those of us that are moms, not just bloggers, it, it can be hard to you know, compartmentalize those different roles that we fill or even feel value if, if we're not working. What advice would you have for moms that are wondering how to, not just how to do it all, but how to find value um, and still feel like they're, they're worthy whether they're working or not? Sure. Um, I have a chapter in the book that's called Enough, and it just tells a simple story about, um, it's a, kind of a well-known fable, I guess you could call it, of mm -hmm. uh, a Mexican fisherman who w enjoys fishing, but basically fishes just enough for the day to earn enough money to support his family and to have a high quality of life, relaxing mm -hmm. and stuff. And a, um, a, you know, a businessman basically asks him to come, you know, you're doing a great job, you could do so much more, you could make so much more money, but you would, obviously, there would be a price, you know, non-stop mm -hmm. working, yada yada, anyway, and then eventually you'll get to retire and enjoy the good life, and he basically describes the life he's having now, and mm -hmm. that's what the Mexican fisherman says, is like, aren't I doing that anyway? And so to me, I think it's essential that we define enough, that you define what's enough for you personally, for you as a family, it's going to be different for everybody. But, you know, yeah, there's a financial, there might be a dollar sign to that for those of us who work. You know, how much do I want to be earning? Because, um, as you know, when you work online, there's always one more thing you can do. There's always one right. more thing you can say yes to. One more project, one more way to earn revenue, one more thing to get involved in. And at some point, you have to say no. And um, you're not going to know what to say no to unless you know what you know enough is mm -hmm. and you know it's easy to to think you just kinda gotta be doing more because you see everybody else doing more and more you know mm -hmm. um, I, I earn money blogging but there are others who do even more than I do and I've learned to be okay with that just because I know what's enough for us and our family so that's I think essential for whether you earn money or not with the work you do is to know what's enough and to feel okay about that Absolutely. And I know you must have gotten asked, you know, how do I get started as a writer? I, I have a book in me. I, I want to write. You know, what advice do you have for for others that are, are bit by the same bug but don't know where to get started? Uh -huh. um, yeah, it's tricky because the way I, you know, everybody has their own path and so there's no one right, right way to do it, obviously. But um, not too long ago I was asked, do I think that in order to be published now you absolutely have to have a blog mm -hmm. and they asked me almost in a way like they were hoping I would not give the answer they thought would be true but <laughs> honestly I really do think the answer is yes yeah. I think um, you know if, if you're interested in being published that's how publishers find new voices that's how they can see your un your, your work that's unedited by somebody else that's how they can you know they it's a free portfolio for them to read um, and it's also just a display of whether you're good at cultivating a community who would eventually buy a book because, you know, publishers are in a business. Right. Um, and so I think for anyone who has a dream of writing a book, they need to definitely start a blog. And if they are hesitant to start a blog, they need to ask themselves why. You know, what, what's your big hesitation? Is it because of rejection? Is it because you're afraid of, I mean, you know, there's a million reasons to be afraid of blogging. Sure. But ultimately, those are going to be the issues you'll have to deal with about book writing, too. You know? Absolutely. And so, yeah. Um, and then just to keep, keep at it. You know, don't write a blog with the purpose of making money because right. you will burn out. Um, most blogger, most blogs don't last more than 30 days. I think statistics have shown, um, and that's just because you go in with these ideas. You realize how hard it is mm -hmm. and how much work it takes. That it's not a passive thing at all. And um, yeah, so to write for the sake of writing, for the joy of writing, um, first and foremost, and to reach out to other bloggers that started either started similarly to you or in your same niche. You know, the writing style or topic, or um, or about the same size of your blog, you know, yeah. to make friends with other bloggers, Absolutely. make it a community. Great advice, great advice. Well, we've got a question on Twitter, and this okay. is from this is from Heather, and she says, Tish, what do you do to encourage your children to value intentional living? Hmm. Well, um, that's a good question. I've got three kids, ages nine, six, and three, and so 
it's definitely not something that they've mastered. You know, I don't know if any of us master it, but right. they are at the young age, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, the nine-year-old is is definitely a little easier than the six and three-year-old. Um, so just to concentrate on her there, um, a lot of a lot of why a lot of why we care about living intentionally is so that we can pass on this legacy of living well and not just. Um, you know, kids getting out of the house and they look back and say, gosh, my mom worked all the time, you know, right. or she was always online or um, or just we traveled, but I don't know why. Um, so for me, I think a really good advice for young kids is to talk about what you're doing all the time. You know, mm -hmm. our kids sometimes, like just screen time for an example. My six and three-year-old are boys and they're obsessed with playing games, you know, on the iPad or on the phone. And when they see my husband or I, you know, checking our phone and we're actually working, to them it looks the same mm -hmm. as on a screen. And so just simply saying things like, I'm checking my email right now, or I need to post my, today's post on Twitter or whatever, you know, having them come along and joining you in your life and not just assuming um, they'll figure out the intentional perspective. It's it's a lot of modeling, but it's also talking through the things. So that's that's been something that I've really learned lately as they watch you, you know, even when you don't notice, um, to make sure that it's clear, you know, uh, what your motive is. Um, so that's that's something I've been doing lately. Absolutely. Good reminder. We have a question, too, from Gina, and she says, any tips on low-cost travel or alternatives to travel uh, while still stimulating uh, the five senses, and she has hashtag single mom as well, so I would imagine uh -huh. as a single mom that might be harder to do. So the low cost aspect is obviously near and dear to my heart. What, <laughs> what yeah. advice do you have? Two, actually. Yeah. Me too. Um, yeah, well, I guess there's a couple layers to that question, but um, if travel isn't an option at all, I would say think of, think of your life in, in chunks of seasons and think that you're not necessarily saying no to travel, you're just saying not now. You know, there are obvious times when it's just not as feasible when you have a newborn or um, just lots of other life stuff coming up. So don't write off travel as something that you'll never get to do because I think there are just times when it's just not mm -hmm. a good option, responsible option. Um, that said, I do think it would, I do place a high value on actual travel and not just, like, I, I love staycations, I love exploring the city, I love exploring the city around, or the, the perimeter around your city, mm -hmm. but... Um, I think it's important to leave preferably your country once in your lifetime, preferably with your kids. And um, honestly, it's kind of that idea of giving up a latte and before you know it, you've saved a hundred bucks a month, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, I like banks that have sinking funds where you can have multiple savings accounts. And I, we have one. Uh, we have about 10, 12 savings accounts that's attached to our one checking account. And there are automatic things that happen, and one of those is our travel fund. And it might not be much. It could be 10 bucks a month. But before you know it, you've got a chunk saved up. Mm -hmm. So also write off um, travel as though it's too expensive. Um, and then there's, what else did she say? Something... <laughs> Just about remember. alternatives to travel, you know, that she mentioned stimulating mm -hmm. the five senses. So I think what are... Oh, yes. Maybe I infer from that what what can you... You know, what does travel, what is the benefit of travel that you could simulate, you know, at home? Uh -huh. Sure. And I think there's also a quote in my book she might have mentioned because I've seen it around about um, home is where the heart is but on the open road lie your five senses. That's mm -hmm. that's something I've, I've said. So that might be what she's referring to. I think so, yeah. um, I think... I think one of the reasons travel is great is because it opens you up to new cultures, new ways of living, new ideas, new tastes, textures, sounds. Mm -hmm. And so if you can't actually be there, I would say it's still really a great idea to explore cultures in your own home, you know. So um, just making different ethnic foods, different, mm -hmm. checking out books at the library about different places, uh, having a map in your home I think is really important. Um, there's lots of YouTube videos, you know, we all the time for lunch breaks sometimes we'll just... You, you know, pull up the iPad on the table and just Google or search on YouTube, like, little videos in China or Japan or, you know, just some country that sounds interesting. And we'll just watch it. You know, so there's all kinds of ways to explore the world, per se, without leaving your home. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, this is a great bridge right now because travel, obviously, is a topic that's near and dear to your heart. <laughs> I know you get a lot of those questions. Mm -hmm. But it can't always be easy. Like you said, you've got a three-, six-, and nine-year-old. There have to be challenges you know, and obviously those of us that are moms of small kids know those those challenges when traveling with small children, whether it's driving or flying. 
you still feel that those, you know, the benefits outweigh the difficulties. What are some ways that you advise people to, you know, to really prepare so that you can avoid as many of those as possible, but really maximize the benefits yeah. of traveling with young children? Well, I think one of the reasons people are scared to travel with children is the fear of the unknown. Um, I think if you've never done it before, it sounds much more daunting than it might actually be. I get that. I understand. Um, but a lot of times, once you do it and you look back and you can say, uh, I mean, I'm not saying every time, but a lot of times you can look back and say, that wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Um, if you also go into travel knowing it's not going to be the same as if you were traveling without children, <laughs> then you kind of set up yourself, you know, you, you regain the right perspective. You know, you know that it's going to be slower, it's going to be louder, it's going to be stickier, you know, all those things. Right. Um, but if you go knowing that's just the way it's going to be, somehow that just helps not be as frustrated. Um, and then, honestly, my kids have become really great travelers just because we do it a lot. And right. so if you can travel as much as possible, um, you know, and the reason we do is because that's just our priority. That's where we choose to spend um, extra money on or just, you know, our budget works that way. Um, then I would say do it because the more you do it, the better they get. You know, people do ask us sometimes, like, why don't you wait to travel when they're older? And I think, you know, our three-year-old knows exactly how to board a plane, knows what to do, knows it's not going to be forever. That doesn't mean he's not wiggly and squirmy, right. but he's gotten so good at it because he's on all the time. Yeah. Um, so it gets better the more you do it. So don't wait um, and for some magical age when it'll get better. Like our nine-year-old is an absolute pro, so it, it yeah. really does get easier the more you do it. Yeah, it's creating that culture, and I think one of the principles that you talked about before when we had that question about how do you help your children live intentionally, and you say, you know, talk to them about what you're doing, include them yeah. in your day-to-day -day life, I think, wouldn't you apply that then for travel, too? You know, like you said, there's some sacrifices that you make because you know travel is important to you, and what do some of those conversations look like, if you can, for your uh -huh. kids? Is You know, is it, I know I'm guilty probably of too often saying, if you want that milkshake, we can't go to Disney World, or if you, you know, and making those. Yeah, exactly. They need those correlations to say, we have to say no to this yep. so that we can say yes to this. Do you have similar experiences or conversations? Oh, daily, daily. <laughs> um, oh, good. You know, my nine-year-old yeah, nine swears that she's the only kid her age that doesn't have a hot pink iPhone or whatever oh, it is that she's wanting. Too. Okay, good. You know, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like she's, and I tell her pretty honestly. Look, I know your cousin has one. I know so so and so has one. The reason we're not investing a lot of money in these, the reason we, you know, go to thrift stores for, I mean, not that she cares about that, but you know, the reason we make the choices we make is so that we can travel, and that's our family's priorities. And you know, I don't know if that that's going to mean later in life she never goes anywhere because you know she's yeah. she's experienced. A, a family of origin that's always on the move, but yeah, I mean, I think it's not going to be an easy thing for them to grasp, and they might actually be internalizing it more than we think they do. Mm -hmm. But looking back, I think you know, I think as adults, they will um, understand a lot more um, as they look back. But that doesn't mean that we don't still deal with either tantrums or bad attitudes or whatever when we have to say no. But honestly, that, that that's the line I give them: the whole we say no to this thing so we can say yes to this thing. Absolutely, that's great. Well, we've got another Twitter question. I want to let people know just about 10 more minutes left to get your questions in on Twitter. Remember, it's hashtag notes from a blue bike if you want to join in the conversation with me and Tish here. And also, don't forget about that special code, BIKE25, that you can use to get 25% off the already discounted book over at store.faithgateway.com. You can just click the link below our chat here. Tish, our next question comes from Courtney, and she's asking, what is the book writing process like for you with young kids around? Yeah, um, everyone does it differently, but for me, I tend to write a book all in one chunk as best I can. I wrote Notes from a Blue Bike. Um, I wrote about the first third over the span of maybe six months, and then the, re the last two thirds in one month. And the reason is because of our small kids. My husband works from home, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have to work, you know. And so what we've done, we were able to just flex on our schedule and clear things out to where we got as much help as we could, babysitting-wise. Um, he rearranged his work schedule so he didn't have any major projects. Um, you know, talked with his boss about it and got got things taken care of. 
and he handled things like the laundry and the food and all that for one solid month. And I did almost, I really did nothing but write the book. I wrote from 8 in the morning till 5 at night for one month and just the book. You know, I, I outsourced the blog. I either posted um, reruns or guest posts or whatever it is. Um, and that's all I did. And it was hard for sure, but I had a light at the end of the tunnel the entire time. And I think that was helpful for me to, to you know, have a, a short period but intense. Mm -hmm. um, the other reason is because it's, Unlike writing blog posts, you need to concentrate on one topic for a while. And I, if I were to say I'm going to write a book for two hours, I would spend the first hour rereading what I had just yeah. written to get back in the mode of things, right. you know. And so it would just take so much time. So just having eight hours in one day to write the book helped me stay focused on what I was doing. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, I love this question we just yeah. got from Alyssa. She says, when I can't be traveling, I love to read about it. What are some of your favorite books on the topic, Tish? Oh, fun question. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite writers is Bill Bryson. He's mm. a great travel writer. Anything of his is, you know, fabulous. He's just funny, he's witty, but he has a lot of insight as to the, into the different places he goes. Um, and I love Afar, the magazine, A-F-A-R. That's my mm. favorite travel magazine. It's got such good real-life travel stories. You know, it's not just tips on how to save money, but it's just taking you places. And that I, I'm so like that as well. I love that. Um, I like reading just, if I go to the travel section of a bookstore, there's always just a collection of essays. And that's some of my favorite things to do. Just go to a, either a library or a used bookstore and just find some collection. And, you know, I, I found a great one written by women about Turkey, and I just loved mm -hmm. that. You know, so just kind of hole-in-the-wall, unheard of um, books sometimes tend to be great surprises when it comes to travel writing because um, I'm the same way. Yeah, that's great. Okay, you may yeah. hate this next one. Tony is writing okay. it <laughs> only because it'll be hard for you, I'm sure. But Tony oh, okay. wants to know, what's your favorite place you visited in your travels? Yeah. Can point this one? <laughs> that is so hard. I had a feeling. Oh, gosh. Had a with that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's goods and bads to so many places. I have a special place in my heart for Paris just because it's mm -hmm. such a fun city. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to cities, that's one of my favorites, I would say. Yeah. Um, not cheap. No. <laughs> but we've learned to do it well with kids. Um, you know, and we managed to do it with kids and, and affordably, so I know it can be done. Um, so, I mean, there's just something so amazing about Paris. Like, honestly, every meal was just an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just buying stuff at a corner store and taking it to the grass and eating, it was just like, yes. you know, a come to Jesus moment because the food <laughs> was so phenomenal. Um, I, I love uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand. That The mm. northern Thailand area is fun because it's really inexpensive, yet the people are friendly, amazing, cheap food. I mean, we fed our whole family for like $7, you know, wow. a meal. Um, it's just, it's a friendly people, fun culture. So those are probably two places that come to mind. Yeah, what do you, I mean, we have such a unique experience right now, Tish, to get to talk to you. You know, I feel, I, we're just sitting in a coffee shop, you know. It's just, if, if anyone <laughs> can answer these questions, I think if you could let anyone... You know, now, what do you think is the biggest misconception about you? Because so many people feel like they know you because you've been blogging for so long and because your writing is so personal. You know, you really do take us on a journey. But is there something that you feel like you wish you could let people know, like, no, it, you know, my life isn't that glamorous or it's not this? Is there anything that you really wish you could <laughs> clarify? <Yeah. laughs> um, you know, I think maybe one would be, that the blog started as Simple Mom and is now the Art of Simple. Mm -hmm. The reason I started it was not because I had figured out Simple Living, it's mm -hmm. because I was interested in Simple Living. And so I'm very much on a journey just like the readers. And so I don't have all the answers either or I haven't completely figured it out with my my life. My life can be crazy and chaotic too. You know, I've, I've had experiences where people, I make a new friend and then they find out who I am mm -hmm. and then they say, oh, I want to go to your house to see what it's like. And I'm like, I mean, I promise it's not that fascinating you know it's very much a normal house with Lego everywhere and right. you know I mean and so I guess maybe just that I'm very much a very normal person you know I drive an old minivan I uh, I just do most 99% of the normal mom stuff I do too so yeah so you're not so you're not an expert on family travel then um I may if, it depends on what you mean by expert. I do it a lot, and so just by default, I have a lot of experience, maybe, but I'm not an expert like I've arrived and I have all the answers for everybody, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, you know, what do you think, I'll give you another tough one, if you had to really sum up what you think, this, you know, the experience of travel within a family has done for your family personally, what would be the biggest 
takeaway or the the biggest bond that has come out as a result of being all together as a family? Um, even at the year at our kids' young age, they're all really great friends, and we're very mm. close. And I think the reason is because we all have these shared experiences that no one else will have except for us. We know what it's like to be in our home in Bend, Oregon, but we also know what it's like to be together in you know a, a little fishing village in Turkey and then we also know what it's like to be on the road and to walk through the Smithsonian's like we did just a few weeks ago and then we'll have the same shared experiences when we travel again you know around the world that that will just the, the kids the rest of their lives will be able to you know even when they're married and have kids of their own they can call up their brother and say hey do you remember that one time we had that crazy you know meal in on that Greek island and they'll have that experience together and so I think just the shared experiences does so much for building our unity. Yeah. Well, you know, just one last question is all we have time for, Tish, believe it or not. <laughs> this is from Naomi, and uh, she says, Tish, what are some ways you connect with local people and culture when traveling? You know, you've mentioned the street food and just getting to absorb the neighborhoods. You're not, <laughs> you're not talking about just checking yourself into a hotel somewhere and hanging out in a hotel. I mean, you really do a good job of embracing not just the culture but the people and the neighborhoods it seems like sometimes. Mm -hmm. What? How do you do that? Well, that's another benefit to family travel. Kids are a great in mm. to um, <laughs> getting to know locals and to real life stuff. Um, yeah. First of all, most cultures, not saying the Americans aren't like this either, but um, most cultures love children. Mm. And my children's ha my children, most of them have blonde hair. Oh. Mm. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting over a cold. Um, <laughs> Ahead, and so take, we kind of stick out in that way. <laughs> right. Um, our, our kids tend to stick out. Mm -hmm. And we see that as a good thing, you know. And so whenever the people come up and want to say hi, you know, we can easily say hi back. And, you know, we can maybe try a few phrases in their culture. That's, that's another thing, you know, just having the Google Translate app on your phone mm -hmm. is helpful Great because thing. you can know the basics like hello and little phrase. And then they can have a good laugh at trying to help you talk, you know. Um, and so really, kids is a huge asset to just getting to know the real life side of a culture. Yeah. Well, I'm going to lead in with my last question here. First of all, <laughs> two parts. What are some of those favorite apps that you have? Because you're going to be taking a huge trip coming <coughs> up. You and your family are actually going to be going around the world working on your next book. So lead off with telling me about are there any apps that you find really helpful? And then tell us a little bit more about this. This is truly an adventure. I'm going to call this an adventure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it is. This is more than it most totally of us embark I'm, upon. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I'm actually looking at my phone now because I couldn't remember the name of one. Um, one of them that I use a lot is called TripIt, T-R-I-P-I-T, -I -I and I like it because it consolidates all your trip information, like your your plane, you know, your flight information, mm -hmm. your hotel. Mm -hmm. You can email it to yourself at an email address they give you, and it yeah. consolidates into this one app. And so you can just open everything, so you don't have to open, you know, the United app and then the right the you know, you, you have everything in one site and um, an app, and I really like that one a lot. Um, I like Hotel Tonight because it shows you the um, hotel deals. A lot of hotels will just add their remaining rooms mm. only for that night mm. on this one app. And, um, and so sometimes you can find really amazing deals in cities there, and I like that a lot. Um, <clears throat> I also like, honestly, things like Instagram. I know that's kind of, you know... I've just found a lot of good tips even on Instagram, just yeah. like following certain hashtags, you know, based on the city you're in. You can find great tips for where to eat, um, what to go see, you know, even just like what, what the weather's like or what the lines are like at that certain mm -hmm. thing. It, just from a recent photo, I mean, it, that's not what its purpose is, but it certainly <laughs> helped us a lot. And searching the geotags, I've learned, Katia Presnell taught me that, by searching mm -hmm. the geotags on Instagram, That's right. you can find That's out right. a lot about places. So, yeah, you learn something new. That's right, yeah. Today. Yeah, Instagram is great for that. And Twitter, you know, a lot of times we'll be on the road about to head into somewhere and we'll see that that's where we're going to have dinner and I'll just say like hey and just use the hashtag of you know whatever Sacramento and, right. and people name all kinds of things so we've hardly we don't eat you know your standard chains we'd like to try out places lo you know local restaurants and stuff and yeah. that's a great way to do it <clears throat> that's great well tell us a little bit I, I alluded to this trip that you're going to be taking working mm -hmm. on your next book and I'm going to have to let you talk about it because it's having to do with how different cultures express 
hospitality, and that's something I don't have. That bone got left out of my body when I, <laughs> when God was. <laughs> but you're literally going to be putting it to the test and going around the world with your family, uh, not just mm -hmm. for the purpose of writing a book, but it is going to be, you know, fodder for your for your next project. Correct? Yeah, it is. Yeah, there's there's quite a few reasons we're going on the trip, but one of them is for my next book. Yeah. Um, so starting in September, we're hoping about a school year's long um, journey around the world. Wow where we're going to start in China and just kind of head in one direction back to the U.S. Um, and, the, and the reason we're interested in hospitality is because that's one of the first things you experience, that is the first thing you experience in a culture. Hmm. As a stranger, as a foreigner, what is what are these people like towards someone that they've never met or towards someone that's different from them? So that's what I mean by hospitality. Hmm. I don't necessarily okay. mean having people over dinner with, Your house you know, what, what are their centerpieces like. Okay. <laughs> Right, right. Okay. It's not that side of hospitality. Okay. Although that could be some of it. But um, no, it's it's more like how do you welcome a stranger or how, mm. what are your cultural, uh, just your tendencies and what can we learn from each other. So this isn't going to be a book about, um, you know, how America is bad and look at all these other cultures who've got it great. Um, it's going to be more just a collection of stories and um, exploring what we can all learn from each other through these stories. And so our family... We'll be going, and you know we've got some pegs. These places we definitely are going to go to for a number of reasons, but we're going to take it really slowly and be laid back and just see, go where the stories are. You know, so if we're in some city and it seems like we're just getting to meet a lot of people and experience a lot, we'll stay there and then move on to other places. And the goal is to be back by the next summer sometime. That's great. That's, well, I can't wait for that. Again, this is, we've been speaking with Tish Oxenreiter, author of Notes from a Blue Bike, and Tish. Final words, you know, ironically, we're in spring break for a lot of us, or spring break is coming mm -hmm. up, or just that, just that season. And, you know, I always say, I use Disney as an example just because that's where we go a lot, but, you know, you, you find people planning and doing all these things, and then half the time they're yelling at their kids, or they're saying, you can't cry, <laughs> you know what we did to do this. Yes. What final words would you have for those, those of us as parents, you know, blending the living intentionally, but also really enjoying the moment and, and just instilling that, that sense in your children. What, what encouragement above mm -hmm. anything would you have for us as we finish <clears throat> off tonight? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I encourage adults to think back to when they were kids and to think of some of their favorite memories, mm -hmm. um, either holidays or a vacation. And to think about what made those particular things so special. And it's usually not, the, the minute by minute hour of um, you know where you ate, what you did, what souvenirs you got, mm. um, even where you went in so, you know some cases, um, it's the general feeling. You know you can look back and say we had a good time, or I or sometimes you have those specific memories, but it's not usually the keychain with your name on it kind of right. souvenir. It's usually <laughs> that my my dad and I went on this walk together and we spent time you know, at this one spot sitting on a rock and just talking, that kind of thing. Basically, think about your own childhood and mm -hmm. think about what matters to you now as an adult. To not get stressed over our kids' um, just, <clears throat> you know, childlike requests or demands for, for more things, more souvenirs, more excitement, less boredom. To, to actually welcome those things as gifts for, for building their character. You know, the idea of being bored being a gift, really, because yeah. then that's when their imagination fosters. And, and to not apologize for it, not to say, I'm sorry, kids, I wish we could do more. Mm. Um, to not do that, you know, because then there's the tendency to feel sorry for yourself, but to actually welcome um, welcome the slower paced life because um, you know that you have fond memories of that as a kid, you know, that, that that was a good thing in your life. And so to not feel badly that that won't be a good thing for your kids, too. Absolutely. Couldn't think of a better way to end it. Tish, thank you so much for being with us. Again, notes thank from a you. blue bike. You can get it right now at store.faithgateway.com or click on the link below. Make sure to enter bike25 to get an extra 25% off the already discounted price. And please continue the conversation. Keep using hashtag notes from a blue bike. We love hearing your questions and comments about how to live more intentionally. And, and Tish, we have loved following your journey and will continue to do so. Thanks again. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun. Absolutely. Talk to you next time. All right. Bye. All right. Bye.